small magnetic loop antennas. Uh, there's an example of one. Uh, I'd like to have that backyard. I probably wouldn't need a small magnetic loop antenna, but that may be someone who uh, is actually in a condo or apartment that can't really put up anything in the park over there. So the outline here is a bit of an introduction. Uh, advantages, disadvantages, we'll talk some theory, apologize for that, but I think a little bit is, is necessary. Building your own, and we'll look at some of Amir's uh, experiments and some commercial stuff, and then we'll, we'll summarize it all. <clears throat> okay, so as far as the advantages for doing this, you might hear a lot of people talk about um, mitigating RFI. In other words, you've got man-made noise, somebody's got uh, uh, something electrical running, and these antennas tend to be pretty good at, at nulling this out. The problem is which direction is your signal coming relative to the noise? So uh, you can't always be successful, but sometimes you can. And we'll talk about also um, the size. That's one of the major advantages. A lot of people use these things on on soda or poda uh, activations, so they can fit in a backpack. Also uh, on a balcony, if you uh, uh, have a homeowner's uh, policy that doesn't allow you to uh, put up a, a big antenna, you can sometimes get away with some things, and we'll look at some of those examples. Um, typically, noise is uh, vertically oriented, at least the electric field is. So like I said, uh, you can you can rotate these antennas to try to null that out. We'll look at that in more detail. There's two main types of, of loop antennas. Um, we're talking about the magnetic variety. Uh, there's the uh, receive only, and then there's the transmit receive. And if you're doing receive only, there's actually two types of those. There's the active, which means you actually have to apply a voltage. And the voltage is used to amplify the signals. So an active antenna or um, without any active uh, amplifier, you can just use it as a straight resistive, sorry, a, a, a receiving antenna. And then the, uh, the passive ones, um, like Amir is going to show with the MFJ, you can uh, transmit and receive. So there's different ways of doing all these things. Um, uh, I was interest, intrigued by some of the research I did, and it says, uh, of course, every DXer who's on 80 and 160 has a magnetic loop. There's just no, no question about it. <laughs> uh, not quite everyone, but I'm working on it. Um, and then, of course, the trade-offs. Uh, antennas are always uh, compromises of something. There's no perfect antenna. But... Um, we'll talk about radiation resistance. And this is one of the main um, sort of breakthroughs that the light went on for me when I was um, doing this is what is radiation resistance and why, why does it need to be large? And then we'll talk about uh, the other types of losses that we have and efficiency in these things. Okay, <clears throat> here's some pictures. Pictures are always good. And um, if you're, an experimenter, which I hope everyone is uh, on here, uh, then there's no end to experimenting. You can see in the picture on the left, the guy's got, I think that's a KX2 uh, transceiver, a uh, uh, little guy, and he's putting some power on his balcony. And if you look at the very left side of this thing, it looks like a picture frame. That's his magnetic loop. They can be square, they can be octagonal, they can be round. Uh, the thing that kind of is intriguing here is it's up against the metal railing, which supposedly is a no-no. But the metal is uh, perpendicular to the direction. This, this thing would radiate um, perpendicular to the long axis in theory. So it's this uh, long axis or is, is vertical, so the radiation should come off um, across the balcony or away from the balcony, uh, more so than up and down. So I don't know how well that would work. They tell you that you need to be uh, away from other metal objects, but who knows, uh, give it a try. This guy in England uh, made a five band uh, magnetic loop 
in his, and he stuck it up in his attic. And supposedly it works quite well. And I ran into a comment where the guy said, anyone with a hacksaw can make a magnetic loop antenna. All you need is a hacksaw. So uh, that sounds like a challenge to some people. Uh, this one, there's a, a commercial uh, antenna out on somebody's balcony. I don't know where this is. I just pulled it off the web. And you can see a couple of the main components here. The big loop, uh, uh, you've got some kind of uh, coupling device here, which is a, basically a tuned capacitor. And then you've got this other little loop. And you'll see a lot of these with this um, coupling loop. We'll talk about those. All kinds of variations on a theme. All right. Well, I have to apologize up ahead of time. There's a little bit of theory in here, but I, I, I'm trying not to make it too difficult. So in Antenna Theory 101, you have a point source, and then you have a spherical radiation, and that's called omnidirectional. And if it's uh, lossless, you get a perfectly spherical wave coming out from that point source, like almost like a pebble dropped in the pond, except you've got the full 3D sphere. If you have a dipole um, radiating, then you actually have some directionality, and then you start talking about gain. And so the gain compared to a perfect sphere is about 2 dB over this one because it is directional. And here we're talking only electrical field, the magnetic field, which is at right angles to the electric field, is perpendicular be into the page or the screen here. So uh, what happens, you run out of space, you're in a, in a city, uh, you're, you're on a city lot, and you can't uh, put up an antenna wire, which is uh, half wavelength long, uh, is your typical dipole. So you decide, okay, I'm gonna shorten that wire and I'm going to uh, use a tuner or I'm going to use something reactive like capacitive or inductive to tune that thing, to make it resonant, even though it's smaller than it should be. And so if you make a shorter wire, then it's going to become capacitive. So what do we do? We add inductance. You'll see on a, uh, on a truck, a uh, vehicle, or somebody's got an HF antenna, there's a big loading coil. That inductance is compensating for the fact that you've got a capacitive reactance. It's, it's capacitive, so you want to cancel out those two components and become totally just resistive. So that's uh, uh, one of the things you have to worry about when you shorten your wire. And then when you do that, you have to talk about the Q, the Q factor, or the uh, bandwidth or the narrowness of the, the bandwidth of that antenna. So the shorter you make it, usually the, the higher the Q you need. And, and so you, you don't get much bandwidth out of this thing. Ideally, if you had um, the second point here, uh, you would get a 50% efficient antenna if the, the uh, half the uh, power that you're putting into that antenna goes into the coil or the inductor and half goes into the, the antenna itself, then you're 50% you're, uh, efficient. Uh, matching an antenna with low radiation resistance to a 50 ohm impedance, in other words, the, the back of your radio, your transmitter, can be uh, challenging. And what I discovered with these magnetic loop antennas is they tend to have extremely low uh, radiation resistance. We're talking less than half an ohm, sometimes 0.001 ohms. And so you're trying to uh, match that with 50 ohms. And it, it can be really uh, difficult to do. Uh, and, and so here, when I started thinking about magnetic loop antennas, they said, well, what if you started with a, you know, like your old fashioned electromagnet, you had a nail and you put a piece of wire and you wound it around the nail and you hooked some electricity up to it and it's electromagnet. Well, that's, you've got a magnetic field. Now you take that nail and you turn it into a circle you know, back on itself. Well, that's basically a small magnetic loop antenna. It's gonna radiate. You put a, uh, an alternating current on it, 
and that it can, if it's alternating at a radial frequency, you've got a radial frequency antenna. Now, what they've discovered is you can use a piece of coax or, or a piece of copper tubing uh, and make your own antenna. Uh, and so that it's going to have a, a magnetic field. You can see the B uh, vector going around this whole thing. And it's going to set up like a donut shape uh, pattern around the loop. And what you need to do, because this is a big inductor, is you need to balance that off with a capacitor. And once you have uh, the right capacitance, then you'll have uh, basically canceled out the inductive reactance with the capacitive reactance and just have a resistive, highly resistive to radio waves um, antenna. And that's what you want. So in other words, you're gonna try to maximize the radiation resistance. And we'll talk about that in, in more detail here. Now, what, another thing I learned was that even with small power, 10 watts, you can have three or four amps of current circulating uniformly around this loop and also a very high voltage at the capacitor. So this thing can be uh, dangerous uh, to touch <laughs> if you're not careful. And then another thing uh, I discovered is these things can be quite noisy. So what they've done is added a metal tube around these, uh, these antennas. And you'll see what looks like a shiny tube on some of the commercial ones. Uh, to, and that tube uh, helps to, uh, you ground it and it helps to get rid of some of the uh, additional noise that they could be uh, susceptible to. Okay, now, uh, there's three main ways of coupling your transmitter or receiver to a magnetic loop. One is the capacitive match, which we've been talking, and it's actually, think of a capacitive voltage divider. You're, you're tuning this main capacitor, uh, and, and the voltage is going to uh, change across there, but we're talking the complex voltage. Uh, another way of doing it is, uh, is just putting a, a loop around the antenna itself. And ba basically, um, it's an auto transformer. You've got a loop inside a loop. And the third way, which seems to be more, most popular for commercial purposes, is another loop, which um, is an impedance match. And you build this loop, and then uh, if you're building your own antenna and you find that if you twist the loop in and out of the plane, you can, you can usually find an optimal spot where the impedance matches just right. So you don't have to get the loop perfectly uh, the right size. You can get it in and out of the plane so that it can, uh, it can couple properly. So those are the three main ways. And just before we, we got on the air here, uh, Mira was showing me uh, one of his antennas and he's used uh, the middle approach. So. And he's got another one which uses this one, which he'll show you also. So they're all three of these are, are very much used. Okay, I found a source, a guy named Steve Yates from Texas, and uh, in some of the theory. So just uh, to go over some of these points that these small mag magnetic antennas or magnetic loop antennas are only magnetic in the near field. In other words, less than a, a wavelength away. So uh, when you get beyond a wavelength, they're, they act more like a regular antenna with the electric field. So th this is something I wasn't really too aware of, but it makes sense because otherwise you wouldn't be able to pick up radio signals from people that are transmitting normally with dipoles and yaggies and everything else, and they wouldn't hear you either. But we all know that uh, you can't have an electric field without a magnetic field in a RF wave and vice versa. So the far field, where you're greater than a wavelength away, is pretty much the same. So when you talk about the advantage of a magnetic loop, you're talking about less, typically less than a tenth of a wavelength is where it, it really comes into, uh, into force here. So for example, if you're on 80 meters, uh, that's eight meters away. So if you're going to cancel out noise from a neighbor, well, they're, they're probably about eight meters or less away. 
uh, 25 feet from your antenna. So I've got a house next door to me and behind me that are probably in that ballpark. Uh, but if it's farther than that, it probably won't cancel much of the noise coming in that way for 80 meters anyway. And as you get higher in frequency for 20 meters, that distance gets smaller and smaller. So if you got a lot of noise on 20 meters, you're probably not going to cancel that out from a neighbor. Uh, but if that noise is coming from your own house, then that may be a big advantage. Um, let's see. Yeah, and it also makes the point here where you're supposed to place these less than a tenth of a wavelength uh, from ferrous objects because of the, you know, you're going to um, compromise the magnetic field. But I've seen it, many examples where that doesn't seem to bother the antenna or people do it anyway. Um, magnetic loop antennas attenuate noise only if the offending source is in the near field and truly E. Uh, electric field in origin, like a nearby power line that's arcing. Um, and finally, there's some question as to whether or not these antennas have a better or poor signal to noise ratio than larger antennas. And there's a lot of work done on that. And I think so. there's so many variables in that, I'm not going to make a blanket statement here. Now, here's an example of a small loop. And if you look at this, looks like a stop sign, the octagon is standing up. It's, that's the Z axis uh, vertically, and the X is uh, coming like this and Y out. And if you look at that pattern, the radiation pattern from above, so along the Z axis, um, the X axis is horizontal and the Y axis is vertical, then you get a um, vertical polarization which is kind of like a dipole. And you get a horizontal polarization, which is in the other sense, along the y-axis, which attenuates very quickly. So think of these as um, radiating kind of like a dipole. So the way you want to orientate the, uh, the antenna is the, the, uh, the radio waves are going to be received and transmitted uh, you know, in a uh, sort of along this x-axis and up from the ground along the z or z-axis. All right, we'll talk a little bit more about patterns in a, in a little bit. So, take a second here to gather our thoughts. Uh, Want to design a loop antenna? Well, according to the book, you only get to pick two out of the three things here. It's like the old good, fast, and cheap. You only get two. Well, here, small, efficient, or broadband. And he makes a point. If you build a wide bandwidth, small antenna, you've built a dummy load. It's not going to radiate anywhere. So, you, again, you have to pick. What do you want? So, if I want 160 meters and I wanted to transmit, then I have to build something fairly, fairly big. I can't. I can't cheat and have only like a three foot diameter. Uh, so the efficiency and all these things, the broadbandness, that's also Q, are, are very important. So here's a schematic of this thing. Here's the loop, the main, uh, uh, what we call the, uh, the secondary loop, because the primary loop is this little one that connects up to your coax. And that's, you're actually transmitting into this little loop and it's coupled to the big loop. And if it's tuned properly with this capacitor, then it's radiating. So that's how they work. And there's an equivalent circuit. And you've got the loop inductance, you've got the tuning capacitor, and you've also got loss resistance because this thing is made of metal and it's gonna heat up, especially when you get four amps or 10 amps of current in here. <clears throat> so you have to have a, a, a robust, uh, conductor in here. Now, this is where it gets really interesting for me. I don't know if you'll agree, but anyway, there's a, another equivalent circuit. Okay, this is your, L is your inductance in your loop. There's your variable capacitor to tune the loop. There's your radio 
uh, radiation resistance, and then you've got resistive loss. So resistive loss is easy to understand. That's just Ohm's law, and you're losing power in the, in the uh, conductor. But this radiation resistance is the key point. And I'll just read this because it's, it takes a few times to sink in, at least it did for me. It's a hypothetical electrical analogy that allows a representation of resistance. Just as current flows through a normal resistor, the resultant power is converted to heat. Current through the radiation resistance results in power converted to electromagnetic radiation. So what that means, I, I, I think of a light bulb. The idea of a light bulb is you want it to emit light. That's radiation. So you put this thing called a filament in there, and that has resistance. If it didn't have any resistance, it wouldn't light up. The, the power would just go through this. And um, so, um, yeah, it, it, you know, you want a resistance that's going to make uh, as much light as possible. Well, here, this radiation resistance, you want it to, um, to be as high as possible as opposing the radio waves. So the radio waves that come into this antenna will hit this radiation resistance and, and get transmitted out as radio waves. So let's uh, think about it in that sense. And your dipole, your regular radio antennas have very high radiation resistance. They're very efficient at doing that. And you'll get a high current. And so you'll get a high, um, you know, in the center of your dipole, your half wave, and you'll get uh, that current will be responsible for transmitting your waves out to, into space. Same as here in the loop, you want this radiation resistance to be very high. And so uh, everything is done to minimize the heating loss, but to maximize this radiation resistance. So you're getting as much energy that's coming into the loop from your transmitter being sent out. Um, any questions on that? This is a key point here. All right, now we go into the real math. Um, no, that's, that, that shouldn't be in here. Okay, here's the, um, for, okay, um, the, there's a lot of equations in here, and this, this will be posted on the website, but I want to draw your attention to the top two. We talked about radiation resistance right now. We want to maximize that. Well, it's a, a tiny number times F, which is your frequency, squared, and the A is the area of the loop. But the frequency squared is also squared, so it's proportional to the fourth power of the frequency. So you can see as the frequency goes up, it's the radiation resistance is going to go up dramatically, which is why a small magnetic loop for like two meters, 145 megahertz, is going to be uh, much better, much higher than for 160 meters, or for if you're in a cave at a much longer wavelength. That radiation resistance is going to be really, really low. So what you'd want to do is have a big area to compensate for that, but it's only going up as the square of the area, uh, not the fourth power. So that radiation resistance equation tells you right away that uh, you want to, um, you're hooped, <laughs> kind of pardon the pun, if you want to uh, uh, use this for very long wavelengths or very low frequencies. The second thing is the loss resistance. Well, that's a very small number again, times the square root of the frequency and times the, uh, the conductor length in feet divided by the diameter. So what you want to do is, um, this ratio of, of the length to the diameter should be as small as possible. And typically for these small loops that we're dealing with, um, the radiation resistance is on the order of 0.5 ohms. So you want, um, you want the uh, loss resistance to be as small as possible 
so that you're not heating it up and getting less power into the what, what's felt by the radiation resistance. I hope that's making a little bit of sense. Um, so here's the, uh, again, uh, we'll uh, look at this, the gain, and I'm not going to really go over too much of this, but what, what people have done is they compared uh, dipoles that are at a quarter wavelength above the ground with, um, with, um, with these magnetic loop antennas. And they're basically saying that if you're only a quarter wavelength above the ground for a dipole, that's the best you can do. You've got about the same gain as a magnetic loop. The nice thing about your magnetic loop is it doesn't have to be high above the ground at all. The, the rule of thumb is that it should be high enough that you can mow under it, but that's about it. Um, uh, putting it up on your roof uh, or something like that doesn't really help. The other thing I discovered about this, uh, I'm not sure if I've mentioned it anywhere, is you can put a, a reflector, a reflective metal, piece of metal, is big or as long as the diameter of your loop underneath it and it effectively doubles the area of your loop which is a factor of four times really uh, uh, increasing your radiation resistance so I've not tried that or know anyone who's tried that I mentioned it to Amir the other day and he said he was going to try that I don't know if you've had a chance to do that yet Amir uh, but uh, uh huh so has it have you tried it or are you about to you're no, I, I did try it. I didn't have metal, so I just used tin foil over plastic. Perfect fit. And um, it seemed to improve it, but again, I haven't done it in the evening when I really wanted to try uh, 40 meters. So yes. I still have it here ready to, to go. So radials can help, supposedly. And that's uh, one kind of radial, which isn't all that big. So inexpensive. <laughs> yes. Um, and, you know, some people use uh, magnetic loops on top of a vehicle. Well, there's metal right there. So it's, uh, you don't have to go out of your way for that. Okay. So based on those equations, let's just have a look at some of these things. So if your frequency is uh, 80 meters or 3.5 megahertz on here, your efficiency, oh, sorry, I should have said this is for a six foot diameter loop made of five eighths inch copper tubing uh, running 100 watts. So let's, let's say you've got a, a spot on your balcony that you've built one of these things, your homeowners association thing doesn't let you have a, a fancy antenna or anything like that. You tell them that it's just um, um, a clothes drying apparatus or something like that. Um, what's that guy that makes all those funny vacuum cleaners or whatever? Uh, or you can go to Michael's and you yeah. cover it in plastic vine. Yeah, it's a uh, it's something uh, for hanging clothes to dry or whatever. Um, anyway, you've got a six foot diameter loop and it's running 100 watts. It's only four percent efficient uh, with a four kilohertz bandwidth. So in other words, 3.5 to 3.004. Um, and uh, uh, your capacitance that you need to uh, counteract the inductive reactants is 560 picofarads, which is pretty big. And then um, you're getting two and a half kilovolts on that capacitor. So it's got to be able to handle that. A uh, big air variable or a uh, um, vacuum variable, the Q is over 800. And the current circulating in that loop is 31 amps. So that's a lot of power on here. Um, if you're on 40 meters, your efficiency goes way up because I remember that factor of to the fourth power. Your bandwidth is 10 kilohertz, 7.1 to 7.11. And uh, uh, your capacitance, you only need 113 puffs. Your voltage went way up and uh, your Q is still very high and your circulating current is 19 amps. On 20 meters, you're getting a lot more efficient. Um, your bandwidth is 
75 kilohertz, so 14.1 to 14.175. And, uh, and the smaller capacitor, smaller voltage, still pretty substantial, Q and 7 amps. Now, if you take a one foot diameter loop, let's say you want to do direction finding, um, fox hunting. So you make, uh, take a piece of copper tubing and a foot diameter loop and one watt. Well, on 145 megahertz, you're 82% efficient, uh, a good bandwidth, and then your capacitor is only 21 puffs, which is small. Um, you've only got 100 volts on the uh, capacitor and a, small, a reasonable Q, 250 and two amps. So this would make a decent two meter loop for uh, direction finding. If you want to play around with these numbers, there's a, there's a um, link here at the bottom, which uh, you can follow or you can just Google and you'll find it. There's all kinds of calculators that will do that sort of thing. But I just wanted to show the, the range of efficiencies or inefficiencies for the different wavelengths. And so what would you do if you want to transmit on 80 meters and have a, a more efficient? Well, you've got to build a bigger loop. And this is copper. I should point out they, um, that if you use aluminum, it's 60% less efficient than copper. So uh, you're really, um, you don't wanna mess with, with aluminum or other metals. It's gotta be copper when you're building a loop, uh, this kind of loop anyway. And that was the mistake that that article in QST in the 60s made. They tried a, an aluminum loop and they couldn't get anything out of it. So um, here is an actual, uh, uh, whatchamacallit, hang on one sec, I've got a, one second here, my daughter's trying to call me, that should answer her there, all right, sorry about that, um, so this guy compared the precise loop HG1, which sells for $535 with a 20 meter dipole at 15 feet. And his uh, loop was, um, was just above the ground. And what he, what he said was that uh, uh, he had a better radiation pattern uh, for DX than that loop would. So there, you know, it was just on a tripod. Um, okay, so now we move on to active receiving loops. Um, okay, this, this one here shown here has a transistor. It's a very broadband transistor. Uh, and basically it's a loop that covers from 100 kilohertz to 30 megahertz or the entire HF range. Um, it takes advantage of the noise reducing properties, the directional properties of magnetic loops. They claim it outperforms a active whip antenna because of the loop, because it's directional, and there's no tuning required. Uh, on the downside of this, again, you have to place it clear of metal. Um, it's easy to overload this transistor, so you have to short circuit the transistor if you have a transmitter nearby. And they typically don't come with bandpass filters in line, so they pick up the full spectrum of noise as well as signal. So you've got to be careful about that. But a lot of SWLers, uh, shortwave listeners, uh, use these uh, magnetic loops because it covers the whole spectrum and, and uh, it does cut out a lot of noise. Um, here's a... Um, commercial one. It's on uh, DX Engineering, the RF Pro 1B, if you're interested in that. $550. It comes with all these different pieces. Uh, and this is what it was advertising. This uh, 30 dB low noise preamp. Um, and then uh, rejects power line noise, no manual tuning necessary, low profile for HOAs. And uh, that's the um, 
the receive antenna. The passive receiving loop, this is my buddy Max up in Edmonton, V6RST. He built this a couple of years ago for 80 and 160. So he's got uh, separate loops for bo both bands. He found he didn't need an amplifier at all. Um, and it's been working very good. Uh, okay. And then um, this is some of the advantage. If you read about these loops, uh, the signal to noise ratio they say for these loops is 20 dB more than a horizontal dipole in a high noise environment and it, add another 6 dB to that if it's um, uh, if the man-made noise is predominantly vertically polarized. So you're getting 26 dB of improvement signal to noise one of these loops even on 80 160 meters. Um, also another advantage is the high Q of this loop acts as a very narrow bandpass filter. And, and uh, the demonstration that uh, Amir is going to give will show you that. It's uh, very narrow, so you don't get uh, noise amplified from all these uh, other frequencies. Uh, supposedly, the performance is largely unaffected by height above ground. So again, just above lawnmower height is good. And um, you're not really worried about efficiency if you're not transmitting into it. So uh, uh, here, you have to be in the loop to understand this, apparently. Okay, so here's, uh, I found this, uh, actually Max sent me these plans to, that he used to build his loop. Again, um, what he did was he uh, connected up both ends of hard line to a capacitor, and then um, he used a uh, little uh, inductor or a toroid to feed his uh, 50 ohm coax, very simple. And here you, um, you just put some uh, jumper wires on there and you can measure all these different things with your antenna analyzer and figure out how much uh, capacitance you need. He said he didn't even bother with this step. He just put the capacitor across it and tuned for maximum uh, uh, noise on, on 80 or 160. And that was it, very simple. Uh, and here's uh, in the article, what he did was uh, uh, there's the little trimmer capacitor in the middle and he jumpered the, uh, the shield of the uh, hard line with some uh, solder braid. And then, uh, so you can see, and he's got, he added a little capacitor, one of these Mylar capacitors because he needed more capacitance and out to the SO239, very simple. I found that uh, also that it didn't quite match. He only had a uh, 16 ohm um, output with this. So he added a four to nine ratio uh, toroid in here. You can see the blue wire is four turns and the white wire is nine turns. And voila, I got 51 ohms out after a little bit of experimenting and it was resonant at 1.825 megahertz on the 160 meter band and works great. And there's the finished one in the, from the article. Hopefully mine will look something like that um, when we're done. Now for some uh, transmit receive ones, here's some commercial ones. Uh, super high Q loop antennas. This is what Amir is going to show you. Uh, I inherited one of these things from uh, an estate that I'm taking care of and sold it to Peter and Peter sold it to Amir. And so now I'm getting to see, uh, I, I actually tried it out in my backyard. It sort of worked on 40 meters, but now Amir figured out why it wasn't working on the other bands because it was damaged. He did some uh, amazing repairs on it. We'll get to that in a little bit. But one thing that I was really impressed with was the high Q. When it says super high Q, they're not joking. Uh, it's a very touchy um, tuning job. But what it would be, uh, I think, really good for is for something like FT8, where you're on a specific frequency and you're only doing FT8 for quite a while. You set it up, you tune it, and forget about it once it's tuned. But for working a bunch of different stations across the band, it's a pain to, to deal with. Um, here's another one, Chameleon Antenna F Loop or Floop 30 plus Chameleon. Um, it's an aluminum loop, two section aluminum. I would stay clear away from that. 
for $650, I think you can find a better investment. Um, they're, they're even uh, not even shipping yet. And they're, they're so brand new, but I, I would stay away from an aluminum loop. There's, they're gonna have a high um, uh, heating loss. The Alex Loop, Hampack Portable Magnetic Loop. This guy, Alex, um, he was uh, a Brazilian ham. He's, I think he's passed away now, or just recently. PY1AHD. And he came up with a three foot diameter loop. There's a little uh, matching primary loop on the top. And with this little uh, uh, dial here, you can dial in and, and supposedly, I find it hard to believe that this capacitor can handle the voltages uh, almost a thousand volts RMS on across this thing. So I'm not sure what's in it, but maybe for $600, there's a vacuum variable or something like that in there. I don't know. I haven't opened one up. I did the calculation um, and it's got about two amps of circulating current through, through this loop. So uh, don't touch this thing when you're transmitting, at least uh, at the ends here. This one I found very interesting. It doesn't even look like a loop, but it looks, it reminds me, you know, you, you look at C, uh, Morse code keys, the Begali, which sell for like thousands of dollars or at least $500, and they're really stylish and everything. So this is an Italian um, Ciro Mazzoni automatic mag loop antenna. So again, you're probably paying for, uh, for the style, the styling and all this. You can put it on top of your Maserati. At eighteen hundred dollars, and I think what's on top here is a heatsink. Well, I think it probably really needs it. It's got a lot of uh, resistance here. I wouldn't go near this thing, and there's no reviews in in Eham, but it comes with a basically an Arduino type controller with a keypad, and uh, you can try to tune this thing up uh, remotely because you don't want to get too close to this thing. On top, it is the actual capacitor. Is it? Plate. Yeah. Uh, each side, if you look at the other side, has a matching set of interleaved plates. Okay. And he, he does square ones or rectangular. Okay. So have you actually seen one, Amir? Yeah, I've been following him since I found his stuff about three years ago. And I saw his initial tests. And um, he, he designed it in a industrial warehouse area in Italy. That was his first place of business. And it looked like airport hangers. Those are the size of everything. So he brought his first one out called the baby loop, put it down and, and he was hitting, um, from Italy, he was hitting Norway and Iceland on, on 15 watts. Crystal clear, his YouTube videos are, are out there. On uh, what bands? Oh, 40 through 10 it says, yeah. Yeah, 10 to 40. This is the, but I mean, you look at it, it's only, uh, what's the wattage here? 125. So his, big one called the baby loop will do 400 watts Jeez. yeah and it's the only one. i've got some pictures of it here i'll show you and it's 20 it'll come in, in around three thousand euros delivered to calgary i've looked at it <laughs> <laughs> the only thing uh, i don't like about the design is it's a snow and ice trap uh, you'd have to put a big plastic bag over it for the winter or mm -hmm. keep it inside uh, other than that, it's um, his his demos are absolutely unbelievable, and it's Italian. I mean, craftsmanship. It's it's the Ferrari Maserati of magnetic right. antennas. Well, I don't know if snow would be a problem because it would <laughs> when you start transmitting. I was going to ask, does it come with fries? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you for that information. Um, it just to me, it doesn't look quite like a uh, antenna should, but then I, I've been fooled before, so, okay. That, that one is actually called the Stealth, and it's yeah. designed to just sit really, really low. You could put it on top of a car, um, but it's, it's designed for an apartment or whatever. The baby loops are uh, this size and much bigger with the capacitor on top. And I, I did look at his website and uh, Definitely a lot of uh, experimentation. It goes, it's quite extensive. So yeah, he's he's real a real experimenter. Yeah. Okay. So we're at the end of this. Um, to summarize, these antennas have their place. Um, if you have limited space for antennas, you might consider this. 
Um, small, lightweight, portable, can be effective against man-made noise, especially uh, vertically polarized electrical field noise in the near field. Um, for the transmit receive ones, maximum radiation resistance is, is key while minimizing your loss resistance. Uh, they're more efficient the higher the frequency you go and the larger diameter the loop it is and the larger uh, diameter uh, tubing you use. Um, they require a high voltage capacitor uh, and they need to be placed away from metallic objects, but even that is somewhat um, questionable because I've seen just in doing this research, it seems that they work in places you wouldn't expect. So again, you can experiment with that. Um, and I think, you know, as far as the, um, the cost goes, I, I don't know about buying one. I would, I would do what Amir is doing and just play with, uh, building them and, and uh, the parts are not that expensive. Uh, the capacitors, I think you can get, get locally or uh, what's his name, Vasily uh, makes stuff. And uh, uh, so I don't know uh, that you'd put a lot of money into that, but if that's where you do invest uh, your money, then that's that's a, not a bad place. I think you'll, you'll uh, be able to use that uh, variety of places. Um, passive loops, they don't require a high voltage capacitor, so you can get away with a much cheaper uh, capacitor if you're just using it for receive. And if you mount it on a rotator, you can then experiment with uh, nulling out local noise in a particular orientation, um, and they don't need to be high off the ground. So there are some um, definite advantages to, to these things, but... Um, it sounds like to me you need to really play with them. Uh, it's not like, um, you know, when I wanted to get on the air and I did the formula for a dipole and it's 468 over F and you, you put it up and you, you're on the air and you know what you're going to get pretty quick. I think you're going to need to do a, quite a bit more experimenting with a, with a loop, um, especially for the longer wavelengths to see what you can do with it. But all is not lost if you're in an apartment or a condo or someplace where you can't really put up a big antenna. I think there's a lot of stuff you can do. And uh, one of the things I've not really even done much thinking about is multiple loops, uh, two loops or even more where you increase the area for that. I know uh, John Fallows has been uh, playing with two loops for uh, minimizing noise problems. Um, and um, two different receivers and then combining the signals from the two different loops, diversity tuning and that sort of thing. So there's a lot of lot more stuff you can do, but I hope this has given you a little bit of a uh, better idea of what, what these loops are all about. And with that, uh, I'll open up for questions um, and then uh, we'll turn it over to Amir who's got a fantastic demo to show you actual uh, real-time stuff, what he, what um, this MFJ loop can do. Jerry, I had a question, sorry. Uh, my question was about, uh, you mentioned that if you put some uh, grounding plate under, then it's going to increase what actually? Going to increase the, the output uh, radiation? It's, it's, according to what I, um, the book on this stuff, uh, it actually doubles your area of the loop. Okay. So, and with a doubling of the area, that's a squared factor. So it actually increases your radiation resistance by a factor of four. Okay. Okay. Interesting. And it doesn't matter how, like it, it has to be within a half wavelength from the loop. Just, un yeah. If it's, if your loop is six feet above the ground, then you just put on the ground. It okay. Doesn't it's within that one less than one tenth wavelength is when you where you have the magnetic effects the strongest. Okay, all right. Thanks very much. You could even bury it if you wanted. <laughs> okay, very good. In in terms of you know maybe a a, a POTA application or, or even soda, what what size loop? I guess you know how how small could you get away with, and still use it for HF. So say, you know, 
20 meters or like the, you, you, you'd look earlier at, at the um, loop, the six foot loop at 40 meters, obviously that's impractical, but if you wanted to, a loop that would uh, be effective on uh, 20 or 40 meters in a portable application, um, you know, what's, are, are there sort of parameters, ideal parameters in terms of size? What they're actually promoting commercially are these three foot diameter loops uh, for 10 through 40 meters. Personally, I don't think it would be worthwhile for 40 meters. I would limit it to, uh, to, to uh, 20 meters as the, uh, or maybe you get away with 30 meters. But uh, again, your efficiency drops off as the fourth power frequency. So I would, I would say with a three foot loop on 20 meters and you're running 10 watts or maybe up to 20 watts, you can probably do that. Okay. I got interested in small mag loop antennas when I uh, went through my first advanced class with Joe Hoffman. I was kind of hoping he's here tonight, but um, he and I built lots of different uh, iterations of the, the mag loop, but he continued to use it. Uh, I built a few and then kind of was looking for the ultimate solution, but um, he, uh, he actually used it on his uh, FT450 in his basement with great results. Um, I've only started back into it since, um, well, I, I built uh, this one behind me here. Uh, I took the capacitors off. I'm going to show you the, all the bits that I uh, assembled and bought for it and uh, put it together with. But um, when uh, Peter was talking about his MFJ, which I'm going to, here, let me, uh, let me share that guy. So, here we go. So this is actually Peter's. I never did buy it from him. Uh, I've, I've just been the guy who pulled it apart because I've, I've built four now. So I kind of understood the mechanics inside, not as uh, detailed a technical analysis of what Jerry just gave. That, that was amazing. Um, but I, I pulled it apart and I immediately could see that there was problems and it had been dropped. Uh, so here. Uh, it had been dropped. There was damage uh, inside the plates were contacting. So on 20 meters, uh, it was physically shorting right out. So it, it made it impossible to, to really do anything. So I went in and I um, did my best because they're all um, uh, aluminum welded together. It's a solid capacitor. There's no physical parts that you can mess with. And there were lots of these uh, insects that had crawled in and uh, been parched <laughs> through use. Uh, it does have a, a breathing uh, weep hole at the bottom and stuff just got in uh, when it was being used and, and fried. And I'm sure that messed with uh, a lot of the uh, components. So that's the actual uh, tuning capacitor on the top of the rig. And that's the actual um, radiating coil at the bottom. Very simple. And that comes back to um, this box here, which is on my uh, on my other laptop, and that's the control box. So all the motors and whatnot that you, that are driving uh, these bits up here are all controlled inside the house. So you cannot use a one-to-one -one current bailing on a line because you would automatically isolate your. Uh, uh, remote control because it's DC. <laughs> so you, you try to tune it and nothing's happening. And, and so that's, that's one thing you got to be aware of. And you can also mount these horizontal, not just vertical. Um, and I know, Jerry, you were talking about everything but a vertically mounted or a horizontally mounted antenna. And what happens with the horizontal is all of a sudden the same rules that any regular dipole begin to apply to a horizontally mounted mag loop. So if you're on 20 meters, if you're below 35 feet up, um, your, your signal's gonna be a mess. You go to 40 meters conservatively, you're gonna wanna be at least 55, maybe, maybe 62 feet up if you can do it, but horizontally or vertically. It works yeah. as a vertical antenna if it's mounted horizontally 
And if you're anywhere near any metal, you'll get nothing out of it. Yeah. So I'm just gonna go back here. This is just some of the damage that I had dealt with. The case was shattered in various places, split, leaking. It was broken when I got it. Yeah, and it looked like it had fallen. Uh, I physically rebuilt the whole case inside. It's uh, totally weatherproof now. You could probably dip it up to the weep hole at the bottom and it wouldn't leak. One of the bolts had actually snapped off the capacitor in the back from the impact. And I found the nut floating around in the bottom. Whoops, that's too far. Anyway, that is that is that piece. Right now I have it set up outside the house. Uh, looking like da, 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 this. So that's it out front. Tested it in rain. I even took the hose to it just to open it up and check if I was getting anything in. So it is available for sale because it still is Peter's and somebody wants it. <laughs> I've had a great time building it. Um, I think it would be a, a fun um, device to put in your vehicle and go somewhere. The only caveat is you need 12 volts to run the tuner. Um, so that being said, I'm going to stop sharing this screen. Where's the control? And I'm going to go to my little laptop here. I'm just going to quickly show you the capacitors. Did it change? Did I change? There we go. So this is one of the kits that I got from the Sealy B6POP. It's a laser cut. You got two mics on now. Well, Mm -hmm. It's fine. Can you hear me now? Better. Yeah. Okay. So I'm I'm on my desk mic. So this is the kit from Vasily. All 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 I got was the uh, the actual butterfly plates, and everything else I had to kind of figure out um, how to make it uh, sit together, fit together. Um, I just used stainless steel uh, uh, threaded um, rod and um, half inch nuts and spacing with, with washers to get exactly what I wanted. So by the time it was done using that uh, 66 Pacific calculator, this loop or this uh, capacitor should run about 150, 180 watts maximum. Um, problem is it is very hard to get exactly the right amount of tuning and uh, try as I could, I could never find a proper reduction gear for this guy. I went on eBay, I found this little guy. Eight watts, but you put a, a geared, uh, a, a reduction uh, dial on it. Uh, let's see if I can show you that guy running. Mm. Right, you can just make ever so fine an incremental uh, Increase or decrease to the plates instead of going blah blah blah. You can you can just get it to um, make a huge difference when you're actually tuning it. And I'm going to show you on the um, uh, one outside what that actually looks like when it's running for, for real. Go back to the other camera, and this is the control box, and it's just gonna. I just want this here so you can see. Essentially on it is a power button light, which you may or may not want. Power range that you're using doesn't matter right now. And it has frequency controls. So if you um, choose to um, do it like you would any other uh, active tuner, you can put a five watt uh, FM signal into it and hit the fast tune and click on it and off it goes. Beep. When it hits the perfect SWR inside, it'll stop and then it'll allow you to fine tune it in either direction. So I'll just uh, I'll put it up. And when it hits the end of the, the actual rotation inside 
the capacitor unit, it'll automatically stop anyway. There's two sets of limiters on a high and low. So you can see my thumb as I move across here, but now I'm gonna to share to you uh, my SWR play with that antenna active right now outside. So let me share that bad boy. And let me share that to this guy. So this is SWR play. I have it on 7.2 megahertz, uh, 209. I was listening to a guy there earlier. I don't know if they're there or not, but um, let's see what it looks like when I come cruising down from it's probably sitting around 14 megahertz right now. So I'm just going to power it down and you can watch the display as I start to get close or pass right through. It'll probably just blow right through the band. Here it comes and zoom and there I go right through it and out. So I've gone too far and I'm going to slowly bring it up with the fine tuning. Uh, I can see there's a conversation here. Let's see if we can listen in. Seven point one seven seven. Not a whole lot of good usable information there right now. You're looking at the whole. Yeah, this 40 is meter spectrum, forty yeah. meter band. Seven to seven point three megahertz, and I've had this noise here all day. I don't know what that is. Could be uh, I'm generating something here in my uh, shack, but I haven't had time to to source it down yet. So I'm slowly going to tune it back to seven point one seven seven megahertz manually. If I slowly bring it up, we'll see it come up through the band. Too high. Slowly bring it back. And again, this is just minuscule adjustments. So if you don't have the SDR software or radio that displays the spectrum, you're doing this blind. Yes, you can do it simply by listening. Or by or the when, meter. Yeah, or when you key up uh, a small, like a 5 watt FM signal or a carrier or um, a CW signal, uh, the meter on the, on the MFJ will tell you exactly what your SWR is at that particular moment. That sounds like Italy. It's an Italian station. 7.178. But what it's done it, for me uh, here is that it's cut out all the adjacent information. I could be hearing. Uh, and I'm going to quickly pop over. I'm going to go right to the dipole. I have a 20 meter dipole and I'm going to Let's see, we're set, yeah, we're set to it, and we're going to listen and compare amount of noise and signal difference. So now I'm on the dipole. A little more information, but comparatively speaking, look at all the noise that I picked up. And this is my inverted uh, off-center fed uh, dipole that I have at the back of the house. Of course, I'm listening to the guy in the background and I switched. Let's move it over to Oops. Too far, too far, too fast. Come back. Here we go. So it is. And that happens to me often. I hit the high speed up button 
right next to the down. So I'm probably back into 20 meters again. I'm just going to bring it back down here. Every time I say, well, why can't I see anything? Why can't I see anything? It's because of it. And on average, this particular antenna, I think because it dropped, it was dropped and there's still some components in it that are not 100% lined up. The best I can get is about 1.18 uh, for an SWR match. Um, but again, 100 watts, 7 meg to 21 megahertz. So not bad. The Ciro Mazzoni, for instance, uh, the baby loop. Hang on a sec here, I'll uh, find that one again. I had the one up earlier. Close this off here. And I'm going to share out this guy here. So that's the serum only. So that's, a, I think he said 500 watts. Uh, and it's it's a massive, uh, I think he said it's around 48 pounds, uh, a massive piece of hardware. Brill, uh, brilliantly engineered, but it's a true 10 to 40. And you pay for it. Oh, and I found these cool little pictures too, mag loops. And I, I remember as a kid, I th I've seen those before when I used to build models of uh, submarines. Sure enough, uh, I went and did a little research. And yeah, I remember putting in those little loops. Uh, when we did the U-boats. Uh, so they were pretty popular in the German Navy and they survived very well underwater. The uh, submarines typically use frequencies uh, down around uh, 100 to 200 kilohertz. So very, very long wavelengths. So you'd have to use a, a magnetic loop to, uh, because you couldn't have a physical antenna that, you know, a dipole anywhere near that length. Right. And, and that's that's kind of it. Um, it's more of I've done a lot of practical stuff. I was kind of hoping Joe uh, would be on tonight because I know he's done more. Uh, you had that that other antenna with the loop, the uh, auto. Uh, oh right. Inductor. Yeah. Um, to show as well, just a. It, this one shouldn't work at all. I don't understand why why it worked, but. Uh, and I don't remember who uh, I found it from. I just saw the design. I thought, oh, I can make that. Um, share it up again. Super simple. You just need a, oh, come on, keep the remote control back. This one. And again, that's a half inch hard line that I had rescued Kara was throwing out. And for 40 meters, the concept was you built a 20 meter loop, but you took the outer jacket and you transferred the signal to the inside jacket. And that gave you essentially a double loop. And uh, I said, oh, let's see what that looks like at 75 watts. Well, the reason that it, it, it works is because the outer loop uh, connecting up to the inner uh, conductor actually adds the capacitance. That's why you don't need a capacitor there. Uh, so I did. I put the, my uh, DX3000 at 75 watts and I nailed it. <laughs> I was I was surprised. I didn't keep that antenna because I wanted to try something else. Now I think oh, I should have just left it. I could have uh, just thrown it on the back of my truck. But I, I think I still have the uh, material downstairs. So your power goes into from the uh, coax into yeah. that. Yeah, well, also with the red loop. That's where the real current, your primary root loop is the red loop. On the, yeah, right. the red is to the shielding. Yeah. And that's what's inducing the uh, radio waves into the main, into the secondary loop, which is the big loop. Oh, yes, yes. So. Yeah, and it um, it worked. That was my first uh, attempt at 40 meters uh, way back.
I think at that point I only had a 20 meter dipole and I wanted to see what else I could create here. And you've got a high voltage across there, but the hard line can handle that. Yeah. Right? Across from the shield to the center. Yeah, there's a solid conductor there. Very clever. Totally by accident. I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> I just saw somebody's plans and said, I, oh, I can try that. <laughs> and I didn't cook anything in the process. So that's, that was my, my, uh, the plus. The other thing you give up with that antenna is you don't have a shield around it. Like you would, if you had just connected both inner conductors together with a capacitor in between, like you would normally do. Then the outer shield is a, uh, is a noise shield for the inner conductor. That one doesn't have one because you're using both. Yeah. So my next plan is to take this out uh, during the um, uh, Rocky Mountain Rally. And uh, between the races, I'm going to try setting it up. I've got a little uh, 12 volt power supply that I can run this guy on and uh, see if I can do a little 20 meters from the mountains. <laughs> My first, uh, I set it up in the backyard when I first got it. Um, and my first communication was uh, California on, on 20 meters. Uh, when I figured out I needed to point it towards California, that means uh, the plane of the loop has to point to uh, in the direction that you're trying to contact. Yeah. So if you have a, a dipole set up, they will be perpendicular to each other, which is what I have right now. So the mag loop is actually facing north and my dipole is facing east-west, both actually aimed at the exact same radiation pattern. Mm -hmm. But it looks goofy when you do it because, well, no, shouldn't it be, no. <laughs> Questions for Amir or myself? Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know if I got any questions, but that was just excellent, guys. That was really helpful. It, it made a lot of sense to some of the stuff I've been struggling to understand from my friend Ian Drummond about cave radios and their dependence on on small, you know, one meter square mag loops. It, it makes more sense to me now. That was just super good. Well, I was also wanting to build one now for uh, fox hunting. I picked up at the flea market a small UHF mag loop or um. Uh, Yagi handheld, which is perfect, but most of the the uh, uh, fox hunts are on two meters. So but now next is I'm going to build a little one that I can put right on a, a bull thing and hunt with it. By the way, uh, <laughs> in your cell phone, they use typically use a small magnetic loop that's printed on a circuit board. So okay. that's the same principle. And because your frequencies are so much higher, they're so much more efficient uh, that uh, uh, you can you can do that quite easily. So um, it's uh, that works in the very high frequency range much better than in the low frequencies for for uh, DXing that we use. But uh, I'm excited about trying this uh, receive loop. I have a little rotator that it can sit on, and uh, but it'll be uh, just above my deck. Um, with the rotator mounted on the ground so the, the loop can clear the, the railings on my deck and uh, try that out uh, next winter in the DX season on 160 meters and see if I can hear better because I am, have been using my, my 40 foot tower with a, a shunt wire for uh, 160 and it's extremely noisy. So uh, we'll see if, if that uh, helps out at, you know, at all. But I'm not gonna be transmitting with that uh, the six foot loop, that would just be too inefficient. 